Yeah. Uh, I'm about to sit down and start doing the wiring for my power supply that's going to be inside my control panel and I do have to have another one of these for inside the cabinet as well and I've got two of these I believe they're called IC320 electrical sockets uh, they're the one with the fuse and the on off switch and the electrical plug to the outlets. So I've got two of these to wire up. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that. One I cheaped out, went to the dollar store. Hopefully I don't regret that in the future. Uh, but just basically they're rated for power ratings. So I figured the one inside the control panel is pretty low wattage. So this one should be okay for the Raspberry Pi and maybe another little 5 volt power supply and two fans shouldn't be too big of a deal on that one and then I went a little bit more robust with the one that's inside the cabinet uh, basically went with one of these guys it's a little bit more expensive but um, way bigger power rating so I don't have to have any issues with that alright and then I ended up getting myself some 14 to 16 gauge female um, spade connectors they are insulated so that there's no chance for the metal to touch between the two or that are very quite close on the socket and those are going to go on to the male ends of the socket here and you can see I put two next to each other you can see how close that is so that they really have to be insulated tools for this is gonna be pretty simple you need yourself a wire stripper and a crimper um, I find that the cutting part of these crimpers are not very good so I've got myself a pair of diagonal side cutters just to make my life easier and uh, I also have a wire connector crimper that I like using um, there's there's something to be said about having really good tools if you are someone that is making projects and working with your hands you are not having a good time with a twenty dollar dollar store tool set you know barely scraping by and using things that are not intended um, get yourself some nice tools. These things don't cost that much and eventually you have a good tool collection and you enjoy working with them. First up, I'm gonna cut this plug off. I won't be using the plug anymore. And then you need roughly three inches or so. You don't wanna go so short that you can't make the connections jump to the other connection, but you don't need to have six inches either. That's just a waste. So go about three, four inches and that should be more than enough. Inside this main wire, you're going to have three wires, uh, a black, a white, and a green. Those are your positives, your grounds, and your neutral. So, But you also have an outer sheath that you have to cut through. So when you're trying to cut that off, you got to be really careful that you don't go into the other wires underneath. Otherwise, when you pull that insulation off, you've got kind of a dangerous spot where those two wires inside are bare and, and being touched. All right, now when you're trying to figure out how much of this insulation on the individual wires to strip back, you just take your connector and you, f you can take a look down. The, the male part of the spade is gonna go down into here, so there's no sense for the wire going any more than that. So you're roughly looking at like that. So about that much, maybe even a little less because you don't wanna have any exposed copper wire once you've installed it. And all you do is you match up which one of the ends here, which size wire you've got. And what you do is Put a little bit sticking out how much you want to clean off you pinch it and what you do is you kind of hold the wire and you spin this around and that's cutting through the insulation down to the copper wire hold it at a slight angle and then just pull and then there you go now this wire here itself is going to splayed out a bit so what you do is you just give it a little twist and that way it'll fit in the connector a lot easier Oh, there you go. You got one little jumper there and you just got to make a couple more. And if you've crimped it right, you should be able to hold it and pull on the wire and give it a good tug and it shouldn't move at all. If it slips out, then you didn't do it right.
I'm gonna do is I'm gonna find an angle here that I can kind of like so you can see everything. And then I'm gonna pause that image on the screen so you can see it for five seconds or so. And it's meant for you to pause so you can see and wire what you're doing, not to for you to memorize it. So uh, your green wire, this is your ground or your earth. It's gonna come up to the top. And then you've got your black positive one. That's gonna come down off of where that light switch is. And then your white neutral has to actually get split up into two. One of them goes down to this end here, and the other end comes down onto this end here. And then you need to make yourself a little black jumper to go against these two here. What this is gonna do is let you have this switch only light up when you actually have power turned on into the inside, not lit on all the time as soon as you have power plugged in from here. All right, I'm pretty excited. We're gonna start putting the stuff in the control panel. Um, gotta put this hinge back on, buttons, joysticks, trackball. Uh, super stoked, let's get going. Here's a close up of my first button, my number one button. Uh, on mine, anyway, I've, I've got instructions, follow whatever instructions you have, but for mine, there's a little crown kind of logo there. And uh, for me, both of these, both of these are gonna be black wires, and then the top one is yellow, and the bottom is red. So whatever yours is, just make sure you follow the instructions. I'm gonna show you really quickly with one slow, and then uh, I'll just rip through the rest. And um, I'm going to be doing the wiring right now without this mounted so that I've got easier access to all this. Um, just make it easier and then I'll put it all together. Right, the wiring for the buttons is all done and um, man oh man that was pretty simple like besides trying to figure out which one goes where on the first button after that it's just all plug and play um, if you are not getting a kit with these pre-built wires dude like that, that would have been way way more work trying to crimp all the wires and figure out and maybe doing jumping between the buttons for grounds this is pretty easy each one of these buttons has a ground for both the LED and the actual micro switch and um, they both go all of the wires go right back to your um, iPad controller and up uh, to this would be super simple. Um, so next step is putting all of these little connectors to the proper spot on this iPad controller. Uh, this one here is a Rayan EasyGet. All you do is you just, whatever the name brand of your board is, type it into Google uh, and see what kind of stuff or realistically it's right on the instruction panels where they go. now. It is labeled for buttons one, two, three, start, select, etc. 
Um, I don't know if it even really matters. I haven't done this before, but I know that when you go into RetroPie, you can literally just go in and configure your controller and it asks you which button you want A. So you could press that and it would log it. So I don't know if this is more a plug and play and you don't have to do any of that configuration or not. Um, not really sure. But I will try to go in one order uh, so that I can try to have it like that and we'll just see if it matters or not. One thing I have heard is if you do a mirrored setup of your buttons for player one and it's the same as player two, apparently it kind of auto logs that for you and you don't have to configure. But same thing, if you had to go in and configure it, not a big deal. So for me, this is player one and it's kind of like having to imagine what it would be looking like from the other side. So this is going to be my buttons one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then my start select will be up there and it actually has room for another two buttons if I want to add on flipper buttons or something later. So that's kind of cool. So I'm just going to basically find the one for button one, flip it over on the board and it literally tells you K1, this connector only goes in one way so you can't even get that wrong and you just push it in until it clicks and just move on to the next one so pretty self-explanatory just gonna do that now and then there's one over here for your joystick so you can, and you can't even miss that up it's the only five pin connector and the only other thing you need is the actual USB cable which you put on after so let's go ahead and do that That was pretty easy. We'll do the other side. Uh, you can see there was just a touch tight, but I mean that's that's connected. It's not a big deal, and we'll probably just velcro this down or something later. But uh, yeah, if I designed this a little bigger apart, it might have been an issue. Oh, I spoke too soon. I spoke too soon. This needs to get over to here. Uh, well, I got two options, I guess. Pick a couple of these and extend them, or maybe, maybe, if I rotate that, no, I'm gonna have to extend some wires here. So probably easiest would be extending just a couple of ones here. Crappy, well, I'm gonna do the other side and I'll do that another time for both of them. Hmm, well, I'm not sure what's going on. Kind of sucky that they cheaped out over like a couple inches of wire for each of these things, or even just a couple of them longer, but uh, I'm pretty sure they were all the same length. That would be actually pretty hilarious if there were shorter and longer ones of these, but I'm pretty sure they're the same length. But these don't reach, but now this one reaches. So, same problem, just different look. I'm gonna have to extend these wires out for both player one, player two, but not a big deal. Basically just cut, strip back some insulation, have some other wire, solder back in, cover back up and put it together. So we'll do that. All right, another night in the garage, another night free from kids and wife. Um, I have the issue where I can't connect the wires. They, they cheaped out a couple inches on each of these wires and there's just not enough room here. I would like to retain the plug and play functionality of these wires. So what I've got is I've got a bunch of male and female 18 to 22 gauge uh, spade connectors. And so I'm just gonna make up uh, black, red, and white wires for this and just extend it about five, six inches. Uh, so I'm gonna do that for both sides. So I've gotta make about 12 wires to extend these out. I'm gonna to try to match them up with a the color. I don't have yellow wire, so I'll just replace it with white. Uh, it's just for me to be able to figure out where things are going, so it's not that big deal. So I'm gonna start on that. Extension. Just got to cover everything up with black electrical tape and then I'm good to go.
That's pretty sick looking. All right, it's time to install the trackball, the three inch trackball that I got from Holland Computers. And um, when you go to put it in, make sure you put it in the right way. So the orientation looking from the top surface, there should be a, a circuit board on the top and on the left. That's the proper orientation. Um, I did some play testing with the Raspberry Pi already. It's pretty plug and play. You just plug in your USB connector and um, Besides that, there's some sensitivity that I'll have to increase, but um, other than that, just plug and play. So I'm gonna install this now. There are a bunch of other connectors on here. If you are not going to provide extra buttons, because this actually can do three up, up to three other buttons, like a computer mouse, then um, you don't need these. I'm planning on using my regular buttons for whatever buttons I need. And then the only other thing that I do have to hook up eventually is this black and yellow wire. Um, I have to get that to a power supply so that I can get the LED color changing effects. Oh man, this is pretty awesome. This is kind of like my first real look at this control panel, all pretty much assembled with final graphics and chrome T molding and trackball, trackball. I can't wait to light this thing up. That's gonna be pretty amazing. Um, you know what? At this point, this thing is pretty flush and a really great fit and it's gonna hold down that um, carbon fiber vinyl down even a little bit better because I left a little bit in there for when it clamped down, it would hold it. So I'm really happy and um, you know all that finicky little routering that we did a whole bunch of videos back uh, is really worth it. Um, looks pretty good. Um, the powder coated finish on this base plate here isn't the greatest. Might take that out eventually and redo it. It's kind of glossier on one side than it is the other. But uh, other than that, that that's going to be a nice durable finish too so I might just leave it. Oh man! Before I get some really major weight into this arcade cabinet, uh, I'm going to uh, get the tea molding on. So in order to make life easier, I'm going to put some towels down so I don't scratch up the outside surface and lay it down gently and hammer in that tea molding.
and I'm just using a really soft silicone handled screwdriver that's got kind of the right about curve to help push that in. That way I'm not going to try to smash things in there or I'm using something hard that's going to dent and damage that T-molder. For these inside corners, you don't have to notch them out, but you do need to make a cut. And what I do is I figure out where this T-molding is going to lay. Cut one right at the center of the curve, so that's that one. And then cut one a little bit over, a little bit over. And you're going right down to the bottom. And now that way, when you try to make the curve, you can see it separates it without it trying to pull it out of the curve. Good night, and uh, oh my god, I get to work on my arcade twice today. Insane! Uh, well, and to continue on, I'm gonna start putting the digital marquee monitor in and uh, see how far I get tonight. already have programmed my Raspberry Pi Zero to be able to shut off when a button is pressed for the GPIO pinouts, which I'll talk about in a future video, but I do need a push button. So $3.50 is the doorbell buzzer from like Home Depot. So it's just a simple momentary switch on and off. So I just need to wire up something and connect to my Raspberry Pi Zero. never used this stuff before it's called heat shrink amazing stuff you just got to match it the right size and basically don't go twice the size of the wire bigger otherwise it will only shrink so much and it'll still be loose so uh, main thing is you put it on ahead of time because once you got the joint soldered or whatever you're going to do it's um you can't put it back on right slide your shrink wrap so that your joint is about halfway and then you need a heat source so you can use a heat gun or a lighter it's really up to you uh, you don't need a lot of heat if you go too fast you'll actually burn it and you just want the heat you don't want the flame actually touching it
All right, on this Raspberry Pi Zero, we want to connect to GPIO pinouts five and six, I believe, which are one, two down from the top where your SD card. So this one and this one, and it doesn't matter which one you put it in, as long as those get connected when you hit the momentary switch. That's what I've programmed this thing to auto power off on so that we have a safe, clean power way to shut this off. that came in and uh, I thought I'd wait and open up with you guys. Ooh, some chrome bezel buttons. I ordered a whole bunch of button sets. Uh, it was like 10 or 11 bucks for 10 of them. And uh, nice little chrome bezels on them, but I really just needed one and I just need one momentary switch so that I can initiate the start or stop script for the Raspberry Pi Zero so that I can safely shut it on and off and um, my little doorbell momentary switch didn't work. Apparently doorbells they have that little light that glows at night time so you can see where to push the doorbell. That was just enough uh, voltage to kick that always into a shut off sequence and I couldn't shut off on my turn on my Pi. So let's see if one of these will work instead. Alright, these are some extension cables for those four pin pulse width modulated fans. Really only need two just to get it to uh, connect with the other board here. Glass fuses, 5 by 20 mil and what was it, 10 amp or 15 amp. I got my wiring wrong and I actually popped one right away so I had to order it. Uh, I got a whole bunch for down the road future use. I'll probably never even use these my whole life but uh, it was cheaper than getting one individual fuse just about. so. So this is a little computer board. Uh, you get your 12 volt power supply coming in and then you can power up up to three or four of those four, wit, four wire pulse width modulated computer fans. And the cool thing is this actually has a little thermometer, digital thermometer in here so I can set this to whatever temperature I want and have those computer fans turn up until the heat goes out of the control panel and then I can get it to slow down the fan so it's not noisy all the time. So, slick, hopefully this works as intended.
All right, for this board, we've got a little buzzer alarm in case one of the fans stop going and the temperature goes up. Really not needed, but it came with the kit. So, two pin connector in the spot that says beep. And we've got a little thermometer here. That's gonna go in the only other two pin that's there. Got a 10 and a half extension cord for the pulse width modulation. So fan one, another one for the right side for fan two. And then the only other thing I gotta plug in is the 12 volt positive and negative into this guy. Right, so off camera I just made some splitters for positive and negative coming from my power supply and then going to power the f computer fans and the color changing trackball. So I'm going to put those in now. Alright, here comes the time to power it all up and hopefully I don't smell any smoke. Here we go. Oh, look at that! That's pretty awesome. I think I'm going to hit the lights off so you can see what it looks like in the dark. Oh, that is awesome. Next thing is to go up and test the buttons out and make sure everything works before I put it onto the cabinet. I can barely hear the fans too and um, the cool, both fans are working. One's sucking in, one's blowing out and uh, super silent. It's awesome. All right, so after your initial startup, you're gonna be greeted with this screen because it doesn't know any controllers yet. <clears throat> so it's detecting two game pads. Hopefully those are my joystick button iPad controllers. So hold the button. I'm gonna just hold my first button up here on my player one. All right, D-pad down, up, down, left, right, Start, select. Now I don't know how I'm gonna configure my eight button layout, so I'm just gonna basically do the buttons in order on the top row and then whatever's left on the bottom and I'll figure it out later. Okay, and I don't have the analog so or the left right thumb, so I'm just gonna skip these. You just gotta hold it down to skip. And then my hotkey, I'm gonna use my select button as well. Okay, joystick's working. All right, so now that player one is configured, um, apparently as long as you put in the wiring exactly the same as player one for player two, it should be already set up. So we got directional control. And our buttons are working. Up and down, left, right, everything's working. So, player one, player two configured.
time to put the control panel on. It's all tested. All the buttons work, joystick, trackball, everything works, lights up. So uh, we're going to throw it on now. First time stepping up to my own arcade cabinet, uh, checking the height and everything. And Solid. Oh, 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 perfect height for me. No problems. Sweet. Move on. Let's get this thing wrapped up. Last spot on the power bar. These brand new Bluetooth speakers, um, I could bracket them down and screw them down into the enclosure, but I don't really want to ruin these, um, especially if I have to return them. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do some Velcro tape, put one strip here, one there, and then put the opposite part of the Velcro tape up on the cabinet. And um, not only is it going to hold it in place, it should absorb the vibrations a little bit because it'll just be able to move on the Velcro. It's been almost a year in the making and um, all the parts have been put together and now we're time to flip the switch and see how this thing works. All right, Bluetooth stereo is gone. Marquee monitor's turned on. TV's turned on. There is a little bit of a delay on the LCD marquee boot. There's the LCD marquee controller, it's loading. You can change this picture to whatever you want. And then very shortly you're going to have either a default picture or a default MP4 video. So that's the Raspberry Pi Zero, loading up that. And like I said, any video you want. So I just put the way of the wrench up there to get that going. So this will be displayed anytime you are in between picking games or if you pick a game where you don't have the marquee art for it. Okay, now I have an issue here where the TV, because I used a TV instead of a monitor, takes a bit too long and the Raspberry Pi kicks into gear quicker than the TV and so it can't sense the HDMI. So uh, I am manually flipping on the power to the Raspberry Pi and the control panel, and um, we're going to fix that in a future video. So 
I'm going to flip the power on the control panel. Okay, Raspberry Pi is booting up. You can see power is to all of our LED buttons and trackball. And look at that carbon fiber look. Goes well with the top of the panel here. So I'm going to be leaving that loading intro picture. Whew! A year in the making. This is pretty awesome. Uh, it's, it's unreal still. This was so much work, but it was so worth it in the end. Okay, so just loading emulation station. That's going to load all of our different systems that we have in RetroPie, and then uh, ready to play. So you get your list of games, and while you're picking your games, you've got your random default MP4 video or picture that you can pick. And then when you select a game, brings up the game that you want, talks to the Raspberry Pi 0W, and brings up the original artwork. So we're going to play Robbie Roto. So there's the original artwork for this. And then I've added the bezel project. So we've got the original bezel artwork that's there and then the original size of the screen that it was in the arcade so that way nothing's getting stretched or looking distorted. It's even got a nice little kind of blend in with like an old retro looking TV. So, insert a coin. Volume adjustable here if we want it louder or less. No, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I don't know this game at all. But it's a royalty-free game. You can download from MAME.org and uh, free to show you guys on here. Okay, let's see if we get bored of the game. Reset out, and then you'll watch the marquee change and it'll go back to whatever default video we have here. All right, let's wrap on another video from Way of the Wrench, and this time on how to install the rest of your parts in your very own custom Raspberry Pi arcade cabinet. I'm not gonna show this off too much because the video is getting too long, but uh, there will be more videos. Uh, next video up in this series is how the heck do I get this digital marquee communicating with the other Raspberry Pi and, and sharing the artwork, which is a really quite cool feature for this build. Um, if you'd like any behind the scenes videos or pictures, feel free to follow us on Instagram, Way of the Wrench. And if you have any questions or concerns, just put them down below in the comment section and I will get back to you as soon as possible. Till then, take it easy.